James Ian. And uh, in this particular thing, we are going to be reviewing a, a specific product. Uh, but during the course of it, let's talk a bit about uh, the oldie, worldie, classic, uh, old school way of, of dealing with wilderness adventures. Now, <clears throat> a wilderness adventure is specifically set in the wilderness, the overland, rather than a dungeon adventure where you go and wander down a specific thing and the adventure by and large takes place in a single location, be that location multi-leveled or, or what. Now, uh, in the in the day, the advice that we were given through the rule books and the way that these things were played was that a dungeon adventure uh, had a nearby dungeon to a settlement where characters could go and restock. Um, and the rules that this was kind of a specific uh, outline of the way a template of the way that these adventures went. You had a town or a village or something like that where the characters could recover and buy new kit and uh, and do everything that way uh, and a dungeon that wasn't too far away where the characters could go and do all the adventuring so do a bit of adventuring come back to the town recover go back out and do the adventuring now as the characters got <clears throat> as the characters got higher in level they became more self-sufficient so the idea of the uh, the village or the town or whatever nearby to the dungeon didn't necessarily uh, wasn't absolutely necessary anymore they could branch out into the wilderness and have an adventure in the wilderness at large fighting whatever monsters and beasts and whatever that were out there uh, without needing to come back to the town or village so often to go and resupply they could do their own healing now they could uh, do their own foraging for food and they, they could pick themselves up more self-sufficient and the way that uh, the way that this was broken down in at least the basic Dungeons and Dragons rules was you always had the basic rules which led you through uh, the the idea of the dungeon and the settlement near the dungeon, and then you moved on um, to the expert rules, ta -da -da, which then uh, explored wilderness adventures. Uh, more powerful monsters that were, could be living there, uh, higher levels of character play, um, and uh, higher levels of spells and so on. So uh, the two rule books followed on from each other, basic and expert. And this is where we get the BX notation that uh, you may have seen. Now, <clears throat> the, the concept of wilderness adventuring, as laid out in the expert rule book uh, came from finding somewhere to go and flat surfaces are in short supply models. So the idea of wilderness adventuring came from uh, a game called uh, Wilderness Survival, which was a, a board game where you wandered around. You, know, you had your playing piece, your character wander around trying to survive in the wilderness and um, it was a hex movement based thing so uh, and hex maps were pretty common in uh, in the war game campaign world because the, the hexagon is an easy thing to reference you've got 12 points of direction that you can deal with uh, they're not so regimented as squares as a reference uh, you can do all sorts of things with them and you'll see a lot of hexagon type maps in old school and actually new school they're starting to sort of creep back in again so I've seen some modern maps that are hex based as well. So one of the companies that were really good at this especially from a fantasy role playing in a Dungeons and Dragons view uh, was a company called Judges Guild. Now you've heard me go on about Judges Guild in my videos before. Um, so what they did they had a campaign setting called the Wilderlands a number of uh, supplement books and things like that but one of the innovations that it has uh, was the hex crawl kind of idea now excuse me these maps are quite old and quite used and quite battered but this is the sort of idea that they they had with them okay so this is a judge's map now you can see it's sort of largely filled in it's got the terrain in there it's detailed you've got all sorts of bits and pieces in there that are um are are described and there was an accompanying booklet that said uh, that gave you the 
hex references and monster layers and so on. Now, uh, the players wouldn't necessarily know where everything was when they were starting out in life. Uh, and they're, so in order to simulate that kind of thing and to give them a basis on which to work with, Judges Guild also supplied corresponding players maps. As you can see, this one is much, much, much emptier. Largely a blank map with some major features and coastlines marked on it. So you can see the forests are not marked on. Uh, you've got all sorts of odds and sods. So, <clears throat> um, so here, the concept for this particular uh, set is Tarantis is a major city. There you go, you've got Tarantis down there. The area around Tarantis, you've got the river going on there, you've got a, a, the track marked off there, and so on. So the area around Tarantis, down the bottom. I don't know whether that's going to show on up or whatever. but um, And then from there, uh, they can go and explore the wilderness. Let's find where Tarantis is. Ugh. Please don't tear any more than you are. So... Uh, similarly, there's Tarantis down the bottom there, uh, and you can see it's surrounded by surrounded by forest and all sorts of other ropes and swords. So it's very much more detailed for the DM. And the idea was, as the players explored the place, uh, as they wandered around, as they got into each hex, they would be, discover more and more about the world and be able to fill in the details of. Uh, of the world on hex maps so uh, what we used to do is photocopy the damn things so players weren't scribbling on the original maps <laughs> except uh, in dragging those out for this video um, I obviously at some point gave them the original maps to scribble on because one of them is but anyway so if you take that uh, that concept so we've got the idea of they're breaking away from now um, got a town nearby got a dungeon nearby all you really need to do is to travel between the two uh, restock in the town go and beat more monsters up in the uh, in the dungeon break out of that to a more um, here's a whole whack of wilderness for you to explore you've got much more autonomy in which direction you want to go uh, you've got much more uh, independence about your abilities as a character and so on so uh, to example this <clears throat> now um well, let me let me kind of tell you my uh, my my wonder at this module. So, you've seen the expert rules. Now, when I opened them uh, as a kid, um, I was I was absolutely fascinated, mainly because I grew up, or part of the things I grew up on, as well as James Bond movies and the and the uh, <clears throat> uh, British TV show The Avengers and a number of other things. Um, I grew up on uh, Harryhausen. Um, monster movies, a lot of which were dinosaurs. You got stop motion dinosaur movies and and tyrannosaurs attacking triceratopses and and all this kind of stuff. Really uh, loved dark dinosaurs as a kid. And one of my most well loved books as a kid was uh, the Ladybird Book of Dinosaurs. Uh, I mean, my son has it now, but the book is just battered. Um, Love dinosaurs to bit. So when you opened the expert rule book, uh, the expert, sorry, the expert box set, um, and they included a sample adventure in the same way as the basic box set, they included uh, B1 in Search for Unknown or B2, the um, the Keep on the Borderlands, depending on which version you picked up. Uh, in the expert rule book, they included a tutorial wilderness adventure uh, in the form of Dungeon Module X1, The Isle of Dread. Now, the similarities here, you'll remember that the Judges Guild stuff was now uh, several years old by, the, uh, by this point. So the concept of a hex map and letting the players roam free on the hex map to encounter what they will, not a new one by the time that X1 came out. However, X1 is the first module where, in for Dungeons & Dragons, uh, for Dungeons & Dragons, I was published by TSR, where the wilderness was the adventure, the place to adventure in. So the similarities, we go, <clears throat> crack it open, we have um, <clears throat> we have a detailed 
Dungeon Master's map in concert with a virtually blank player's map. So you can see the correlation. So the idea is we've you've got a very contained wilderness in in an island. That's it. So um, there's there's little chance of the players going off the map. Um, so it's kind of you know one of the points of dungeon adventures is the fact that they are a self-contained war game, a, a limited terrain war game where you can channel the players through. Um, and in many cases, a lot of the time, dungeon design goes along a flowchart point of view. You know, you, you channel them into this room and then the greater challenges in the next room and the greater challenges in the next room. So the flow of the dungeon can be seen as a big flowchart. Um, the wilderness adventures can be very expansive. If you've got a whole world and just let them loose on it, they could go anywhere. That is a, a, a the, the amount of notes as a dungeon master that you have to accumulate to uh, to encompass that style of play is just vast. So, uh, an island is great for uh, a wilderness adventure where the wilderness is the adventure. It's self-contained and it's all there. You can give the players a finite map as well. So here you go. You've gone around. Here are the, the borders that you are adventuring within. Um, your characters, for whatever reason, have either picked up a map or they've gone and explored the outside of it by boat or whatever. So you know the general f layout that you've got to deal with. And now you can wander around inside the island to fill in the blanks. So that's that's the the concept of the design. Um, the adventure is is pretty... Uh, it's very, very open. I mean, it is, uh, it's not um, an, an epic adventure. You've got 32 pages, so it's, it's longer than some of them. Some of the, uh, the older adventures were either 8 pages or, uh, or 16 pages. This being 32 pages, but that's the kind of norm uh, for modules of this particular period. Uh, and the adventure itself uh, is not, um, is not a... a a self-fulfilling quest or anything like that it's not like uh, you the characters need to go here and complete this mission it's not like that what you end up with is a um they they come across a uh a letter duh, 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 that says uh, i i've been here and i've discovered stuff and uh, here's some things about it uh page is perforated i ought to be a bit more careful about that um and the players, it's up to the players to go and travel there. There are some encounters along the way where it goes on and says, you know, they can they can uh, go and get attacked by a whale or whatever on the way. But the, the, the idea is to not sink their ship and end the adventure at the bottom of the seas, to actually let them get to the island, um, from which point they can break out into the island. They find some friendly villages where they can use as a base camp or at least a starting point uh, and break out to exploring the wilderness. Um, so they can go and head in search of the treasure that this guy's gone on, uh, or they can just explore the island and sort of run into adventures by accident. Uh, now, there are a lot of, uh, of things to do. You've got villages that are, rent, are fairly well designed. You've got some generic uh, caves that you can populate as a DM yourself uh, or to fill in where uh, blanks will go. You've got pirates. They can defeat, uh, go and have a go at the pirates. Um, more uh, Rakasta, Arania. Is it Arania? I've always said Arania. Uh, yeah, Arania looks good enough. Um, th thanatons. Um, you know, there's always spoilers in these things, so excuse me if I'm showing you as a, as a player all of these things that you're going through, but yeah, you know, tough. I'll put a thing at the top to warn, warn people away that want to play it. And then <clears throat> at the centre of the island, uh, there is yet more stuff, a plateau uh, and a... Oh, do, do, do. where's the map for it? Where's the map for it? Oh, the cover, probably. Um, and a, a secret temple uh, with some very nefarious people or beings or creatures, whatever you want to call them, uh, that I've got plans that, uh, almost by accident, if the players explore the entire island, uh, the, the players can run into and defeat their plots. That, and that's basically it. There's, 
they, they start off perhaps on a treasure hunt. There's things that they can pick up on the way to get an idea about what's going on on the island. The island is, is heavily populated with dinosaurs. That's where the Harryhausen sort of uh, connection with me came on. The cover shows them fighting dinosaurs and there are there are lots of dinosaurs in here. Um, most of the new monsters section is taken up by more dinosaurs. Uh, and um, yeah, that, that's kind of what it is. The wilderness is the adventure. Um, there is a and there is a MacGuffin for getting the players to the island and at least starting them off in their exploration of it. Uh, but then they're left to their own devices to go and fill in the blank map, to go and explore, to go and uh, meet various people uh, of the island, meet various creatures of the island, uh, beat some of them up, make friends with others, uh, and just uh, make, build their own quest from what they find out. Build their own adventure. So the DM's job here is not to to guide them through a linear storyline or even present a storyline at all. It is entirely of the players making they have a start point and what they do with that start point it's up to them um, from a dm's point of view it's a good introduction to that style of wilderness adventure because yeah, unlike the judges guild stuff which is quite expansive um, the island like i said is very self-contained uh, the the encounters within it, the adventure areas within it, these little mini dungeons and things uh, are very well defined and there's um, it, it becomes a job of of refereeing the player's actions um, as a DM rather than trying to keep them on a, a set plot point. There is no real fixed plot point. You can create one as you go along or you can create one in the background. Uh, the nefarious evil at the end, uh, the... Um, in the center of the island you could you could build that you can interact with that you could have stuff with that going on in the background that the players eventually become more and more aware of if you want but uh, other than that it is it's a very good introduction self-contained introduction to uh, that style of hex crawl adventure uh, another important thing that this adventure did was introduce the world to uh, mistara then known as the known world, then not really in a concept of, oh, we're going to create a campaign setting and, and flesh it out as much as it ended up being fleshed out. But here, just given as an example of a, a world, and there's the Isle of Dread down the bottom somewhere, um, as a world that you could sort of put together and uh, and use. But it, but it largely was an, an example of a campaign uh, framework that uh, that DMs could sort of pick up. The, the whole thing is a tutorial module. Uh, here's some world building tips. Here's some wilderness adventure uh, playing tips. And here's a sketch of, uh, of the sort of world that you might want to build. Um, and later, obviously, Mistara became much more detailed through the uh, Gaz series of, uh, of supplements and uh, elsewhere. So that's the, the original Isle of Dread, uh, published in 1981 was originally plonked inside the uh, the expert uh, rule book box set um and uh written by uh, tom mulvey and dave cook who you know both went on to uh, to to good things within the dungeon and dungeons and dragons thing dave cook was uh, the lead designer on second edition advanced Dungeons and dragons and did a number of other things within tsr uh, tom mulvey was uh, was the lead on the basic and expert rule books and also did uh, a fair few uh, good adventures as well so some two really good designers um a good framework a good tutorial about the hex crawl side uh, style of wilderness adventure so really good um but the Isle of dread dread lives on in several other medium now a couple of years ago um as you know if you've been following on my videos through we have done uh a couple of the um or three actually i think of the uh, Goodman Games reincarnated uh, adventures, uh, the uh, old original adventures reincarnated, and the second volume in that series, uh, as published in, let me get the copyright date, 
2018, so four years ago now, oh good grief, time is, is flying, um, they did, they picked up on the Isle of Dread as one. And it kind of made sense that the Isle of Dread was one of the ones they picked up on because they did B1 and B2 in volume one. Uh, this is volume two with X1. So that, that covers all of the introductory stuff that was uh, released with the uh, basic and expert rule books. So that, that sort of foundation kind of thing. Uh, and the the Isle of Dread book, um, it's missing a ribbon, which I kind of, it's a little bit, uh, li a little bit annoying for hardbacks. I do like some form of bookmark uh, with hardbacks. I end up using torn up envelopes and things like this. But as with all of them, we've got some bits and pieces at the beginning. Now, there's some really good ones in this one. Uh, um, I think I enjoyed the preamble fluff in this one more so than uh, than a lot of the others. So we haven't got something like five pages of a, a someone associated with Goodman saying uh, how they enjoyed the adventure when they were a kid. That's, uh, I mean, okay, it might be interesting to some people, but what's more interesting here is we have a bit of a, mo a monologue by uh, Dave Cook about how the adventure came to be and it's quite interesting to read this and and discover that um it was more or less a, a, an accident that they they did it they sort of uh scribbled some ideas down and glued things together and, and ended up with uh, with something that they they felt would serve as a reasonable tutorial for the wilderness style adventure um with no sort of real focus on ah, oh, this is going to be the best adventure ever or anything like that. So uh, it, it's it's a good it's a good start. Um, just an overview of how it was designed. Um, this uh, Paul Reich the third was uh, one of the one of the uh, developers on it, and it was interesting for me to to read this because he's not he's not a figure that features prominently in the in the role-playing um, authorship type thing but uh, it, it's interesting to, for me to read these kind of uh, I don't really want to take away from the guy by saying all oh, secondary people but uh, because his work is really good yeah in in, uh, in the development side of things if you like all of these adventures that are written by Gygax or written by Cook or written by whomever um, take a have a look at the credits and see who were the developers of those uh, those adventures because half the time the writers scribbled something out and it was the developers that really made it or formed those scribbles into the classic that you uh, you love so um it, it's quite it's quite nice to hear from one of these uh, one of these developer guys uh, and apparently uh, according to uh, according to Paul here the deranged ankylosaur uh, encounter uh, was was one of his little touches that uh, that came in uh, which is nice if you know the Isle of Dread you know the encounter I'm talking about um, but it's uh, it's good it's that's a that's an, a nice little touch there as well um, Lawrence Schick there's a, a bit of a monologue from him too going about the origins of the known world setting of, of Mistara um, how it grew out of uh, he and uh, Tom Moldvay's campaign setting that they were playing in, in their local thing and what they glued together from that. Um, an, another interesting uh, read from the origins of D&D. Of &D. Uh, then we've got, um, yeah, the, the ubiquitous uh, sort of, you know, here we go. Here's, here's someone from Goodwin talking about their, uh, their experiences with it. Um, and, and and again another one <coughs> which not quite as interesting to me as with uh, with the original designers and the crew that were involved at the time but however um, mileage may uh, may vary with those uh, and with this one it's only like four pages two guys uh, and only four pages um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the the ones that they put in some of the other, reviews that we've uh, some of the other volumes that they put out in this range uh, have been so extensive because maybe they're on a fixed page count uh, I, I don't know but I found that uh, that one of that some of the ones in the uh, other volumes have been so so 
too much. I can only take too much of. Uh, I mean, I love to. I love to talk. Uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of talk. Uh, with people that have shared adventure sort of things you can share this or this happened in this happened but actually sitting down and reading something saying oh yeah I was I was this old and I was doing this and, um, I don't know I, it, it doesn't uh, I mean the hypocrisy comes in I'm quite happy to go and do that uh, with with stuff that I've gone on and and uh, share my own experiences with uh, with uh, with adventures and stuff like that but so uh, take it take it where you need it's it, the, the what i'm trying to say this has got a, a minimal amount of that goodman retelling stuff in it and a good amount of people that were originally involved in it at the time talking about what they did and how it came to be and how they were the design steps they made and that's far more interesting to me uh, and then there's an interview with dave cook as well which is uh, good to read um, now all of that leads on to the uh, ubiquitous scans of the original versions. Uh, so we have, I mean there's a black and white cover there, but the colour cover is inside the covers. Uh, so we have the original layout for the first version of it, uh, including the maps and everything else. Um, that takes up... Uh, that chunk of it there we go it takes up 32 pages as you would expect uh, then we come to uh, the next printing of it which was uh, which came through from the um when they they recovered everything um redesigned everything and used this three column format uh, which I think I've said before, I find it harder to read the three column format than the two. It doesn't give you, it's a bit more cramped and it doesn't give you as much room to uh, to, to write in. But um, And I, I understand a lot of you are cringing now going, write in, in modules, how dare you, how dare you. But, you know, these things to me are working books. They're, they are, they're used <clears throat> rather than um, sit on the shelf. Anyway, that's, uh, that's by the by. Uh, so, like I said, you've got this. Uh, let's try and find. There we go. There's this three column layout on the pages for the later version of uh, of things, as opposed to the two column, uh, which is a bit more spaced out and a bit easier to find stuff and a bit uh, a bit more room for um, just horror of horrors note taking. Uh, so. That um, that takes us up to the end of that, uh, the pretty handouts and things, and um, again the colour versions of the front and back covers and whatever for that are in the inside leaf. There are no colour plates in this uh, in this adventure, this particular one. There are also no sort of fold out ones um, pages that there are with uh, with x2 and uh, the temple of elemental evil i think um which is kind of understandable it, it, the this adventure didn't have uh, any maps that f went over two pages whereas the, the castle amber one did have a a two page map um of uh, of the mansion so uh, th that fold out page uh, concept is probably necessary in those books um not necessary in this book and, and there isn't anyone there right so that gives us <clears throat> so there's your chunk of uh, of reprints interviews and um preamble monologues and so on which leaves us this much book of adventure which is cool so this is the fifth edition conversion of x1 <clears throat> And as with the other books, it's really well done. It is. Uh, it keeps the flavour of the module while updating uh, the stats and um, some of the elements in there. You know, like saving throws, uh, the different different way of doing saving throws in fifth edition, and different ways of handling traps in fifth edition, all that kind of stuff. It does a really good job of those. Uh, <clears throat> the the good thing about it i mean it even includes it even includes uh 
notes on the uh, notes on the known world slash Mistara and off we go um, so it's pretty much the same um, I think uh, again with the formatting as I've just said it's nice to have the two column format with lots of space on it but these these tables could have been condensed I feel but uh, whatever they they work and at least um, at least where the tables break over a page they're on the same uh, there's probably a technical term for that on the same spread whatever uh, if, you, if you know what the technical term for that is then uh, let me know in the comments um, the explanations of the various random encounters then we get into uh, some of the uh, ubiquitous let's we need to include this kind of stuff scaling adventure for challenges that they have to include in fifth edition adventures because um, just plonking people down in uh, in a in a setting and letting them decide whether an encounter is or is not uh, appropriate for their own characters and determining themselves whether they should run away from it or not uh, heaven forbid so uh, there's a bit of like balancing the um, the encounter using the traditional fifth edition way of encounter design and uh, and so on rather than the let's try and be faithful to the original modules way that they've presented the conversion herein <clears throat> right so um again the map of the island we've got the same maps for the generic caves uh, we've got the map of the village so all of this is pretty much the same um, there are some little bits of differences that they've added in uh, they've added some more layers in now the nice thing what, that they've done I'm just going to flick through this because this is a lot of just you know this is the the translation of this this is the translation of this and so on um, but what they've added in i'm trying to find where have i got it oh, the, the deranged ankylosaur is there as well uh they've, they've added in some more layers and they've also added this whole chapter in more dread which is uh which is even more encounters in the wilderness areas uh, so they've fleshed out they've given uh, characters wandering across the island a lot more to do uh what's also nice is like we said uh, when I was giving you an overview of the original module, it's largely up to the players to go and explore and to discover things and to find their own way through the uh, the environment, the uh, the adventure, the wilderness that is the adventure. Find their own things to do. Um, what uh, what Goodman have done in the additional encounters that they've they've added in and the additional material for the original encounters, they have um, they've put some nice little links in so for example uh, i think one of my favorite ones here is uh there are a group of rakasta on the island um so there you go so so the rakasta camp and in the original it's uh, the rakasta are just there right they're, they're nomads nomadic cat people that that are just there they've set up a, a, a temporary camp there what they actually say in the Goodman version, they've expanded it out so that uh, the Rakasta have come to the Isle of Dread a few months ago. And what they're doing is they are searching for a, a hidden shrine, a, a Rakasta shrine that's on the island somewhere. Uh, and later on in the uh, in the book, in the More Dread section, they have... Um, They have the uh, the Rakasta Shrine. So there we go. The Rakasta Shrine is actually described. So uh, it's it provides little bits of snippets here and there to to do a better job of linking the characters up with the various locations in a more um, uh, if you if you stumble across this, then there is a a little snippet or a little hint or a treasure map or or uh, you know what are you guys doing here? Oh, we're searching for that. Oh, we we could help you with that or something. Linking things up to, so that there are there are more um, 
there's more points, more, more coherence to the locations of the island. So instead of a lot of them being uh, largely separate from each other, it's made the island a, a more... Uh, I can't think of the word. I can't think of a word. Um, sometimes English decides to go and leave me um, hanging for uh, for the specific words I need to go. But um, uh, it's just tied things together quite nicely, uh, and uh, you know made it feel like you're you're going through a place that is not just a collection of of random chunks. It's it's a a, a living, breathing place that interacts and the various things can interact with each other. Uh, so yeah, more stuff on that. Then it goes into the central plateau and goes a bit more into um, into the Tabu Island and the temple and uh, what the evil people there have planned and so on. So th that's slightly adjusted from the original module but um not not to uh not to a massive degree it's still recognizable as what it uh, what it uh, what it was described as uh, and then this section here largely follows the same you know further adventures on the isle of dread it follows the same kind of uh, form as the original adventure did all the outlines that it goes through um which is, you know, some some additional MacGuffins that uh, that may uh, may guide the players into particular directions. Yeah, where you've got, um, uh, yeah, maybe they get hired to go and take out the pirates or something or something like that. You know, using using the locations that are there, but putting specific missions on them, <coughs> which is uh, which is a good possibility. It also introduces this idea of um, of the Isle of Dread being. Uh, an elemental type um, location uh, which um, you know that there's did I ever do a dragon mountain up there which is a kind of uh, this this mountain appears every now and again in and players then get enticed to go and and uh, do something with it um, the concept of the Isle of Dread being used as an elemental type connection um, then allows it to go in between lots of different campaign worlds, which I'll get onto in a second. So the Isle of Dread doesn't necessarily have to be tied to uh, Mistara. It can then pop up in uh, in any world that you want, including your own designs. Um, all you need to do is to have them um, have some MacGuffin that says, "Oh, there's an island out there that you might uh, fancy going to visit," uh, and uh, and the island being there, however temporary you want it to be. A uh, bunch of new monsters, <clears throat> um, some new, new, uh, some old monsters that have now been uh, now made it into into fifth edition from uh, older editions, and some uh, new spells, da -da, including sticks of snakes, which. I don't know. Still don't know why that wasn't a, a fifth edition spell in the official things. Some pre-generated characters, um, some non-player characters, more statistics, more statistics, uh, and the players' handbooks. So the players' handbooks are quite nice. So this is the the letter that they come across that goes, you know, I'm I'm so and so, and I I've found this island and and going visit it and you've got the the blank map kind of idea but these things are quite nice kind of, like a journal of a, a, a dinosaur type um, uh, studier who's uh, put some little pages together about different types of dinosaurs there's quite a few of those That's, which you know from my um, my interest in dinosaurs to start with is quite a nice little thing it's right it's almost like the Ladybird Book of Dinosaurs in in D and D pretty far form, uh, and uh, and finally, uh, just an appendix with all the maps that have been throughout the adventure repeated at the back for easy reference, and then just a bunch of advertising for other Goodman things, and that is Goodman's release, quick overview, breakdown, whatever of the uh, original adventures reincarnated Isle of Dread. Um, it's a good one. 
they're all good actually. I mean, the <coughs> for, for new players and old players and players that like classic uh, classic play uh, and players that, that like new the new version of doing things but want to have a taster and see what it was like in the old days and but don't like don't want to pick up the first edition rules or the basic rules or anything like that want to use fifth edition then um then this is for you and as a, as collector's volumes if you're into that that i think they're great that the interviews and stuff and the fact that you've now got um all all printings all versions of uh, of the original module all in a nice sort of hardback way um i mean one of the things i'm trying to do at the moment is is uh tying up all the various bits about about the the, the official castle grey hawk into a single volume that i can throw at um i can throw at uh lulu or something like that to have a have my own private hardbound version of of all my notes and all um the official notes that have come out in various places on that one thing uh, because the original is well the, the Greyhawk Runes module is is a, a bugger to play on its own it needs a lot of work before you get it through that's by the by that's digressing um uh known for doing that anyway right so that's uh, the Isle of Dread a couple of other things to sort of mention about the Isle of Dread before we leave it alone uh we mentioned the mentioned the the i the concept of the um of the isle of dread being part of the elemental plane of water um now <coughs> this is actually now uh an an official type idea Let's have a look. 52 to 57. What's the betting? So, 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide. <clears throat> uh, here we have the diagram of the inner planes in the, from the 5th edition guide. And as you can see, in the plane of water, the Isle of Dread is very definitely there. So the concept of, of the Isle of Dread being uh, in the elemental planes uh, is is an actual thing, uh, is an official thing. And <coughs> um, so uh, it's kind of nice that this ties up with it if you are using the idea of uh, it being an elemental node. Um, this mentions the possibility of working it that way. So if you want to do that, and if you want to use the official 5th edition line of it being part of the Elemental Plane of Water, then this does tap into that. Um, I, I won't, well, I say I won't, never say never, right? But it, it's not a concept I have in it. Um, there, is, uh, there is one last thing I want to mention about the Eye of Dread. Uh, in Dungeon uh under third edition in dragon and dungeon <clears throat> uh, peso who were uh running those two magazines at the time had this concept of adventure paths which in dungeon magazine you had an episodal adventure uh that built up into a big campaign over time and in dragon you had supplemental material for that campaign uh, they did a few of them uh, one of which was savage tides and part of Savage Tides involved the Isle of Dread. So the characters would go to Isle of Dread. Um, to my mind, completely missed the point, because the point to me of the Isle of Dread is a sandbox, uh, a contained sandbox, whereas the Adventure Paths put specific storylines on top of it. So it's a bit running roughshod, roughshod over the concept of it. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it is there. It is placed within the world of Greyhawk. The uh, the people that inhabit the Art of Dread are the Olmecs. Um, but that adventure in oh issue issue uh, one four. Uh, let me have a look. One four three. So 
Savage in Dungeon issue 143, which has part of the episodal, um, the episodal Savage Tides adventure path. They put a throwaway comment in about some of the Olmecs uh, breaking out, discovering a temple with a, an idol of a an ape in it, and then never being seen again, um, having turned up on the Isle of Ape, the Isle of the Ape. Now, WG six. WG6, the Isle of the Ape, uh, was a World of Greyhawk module that had ties into uh, Castle Greyhawk, that, uh, whatever, that, all the messy kind of stuff. But um, And also, <clears throat> uh, the Isle of the Ape is mentioned in there. The characters have to visit it for someone. But the Isle of the Ape, uh, the, the connection between the Isle of Dread, which is... An, an island, a self-contained island, full of dinosaurs, uh, with a village, sort of safe haven village, with a dirty great big wall written on it. But the Isle of Ape, uh, the Ape is very much a King Kong pastiche. Um, the idea of, of having it, a, a sort of tenuous, forced link between the Isle of Dread and the Isle of the Ape, it's, it's just unnecessary. And I, I, I don't, I don't understand why they were trying to do it. So um, the obviously the Isle of uh, the Isle of the Ape is is uh, came along later than the Isle of Dread. Um, so trying and there were no concepts between them. One was a Greyhawk module. One was set in the known world. Um, the default basic Dungeons and Dragons setting. And it just seems to be along that line where just people want to try and tie everything to everything else. This part of this nostalgia thing where, oh, I'm just we're just going to put in. So, and it's a very much a throwaway part. It, it adds nothing to the Isle of the Dread adventure portion of the adventure that appears in Savage Tides. It adds nothing to the Isle of Dread as a as a, a location for an adventure anyway uh, and adds nothing to the Isle of the Ape uh, other than this this tenuous link that the tribe one of the tribes that turns up on um, or that is depicted in the Isle of the Ape originally came from um, from the Isle of Dread uh, so in my personal opinion that should be completely ignored it's entirely ignorable I don't understand why it was thrown in there. I just think it's a case of, oh, let's try and glue everything together uh, that goes on in certain people's minds um, for tradition's sake or or something. Or maybe it was, um, maybe it was well, let's try and throw everything that's vaguely connected with Dungeons & Dragons into Greyhawk possibility. But anyway, that's that's uh, that was in third edition that they... Um, they put that in, so it's nearly 20-odd years old anyway, so we're, we're, we're past that. But if you want that to happen, then don't, by all means. I don't, I don't see what it adds anyway. Um, and so that's it. That's it. What am I going to do? Do I, do I rate this? I don't know. It's, it, the X1 was not my favourite um, uh, favorite module ever. Uh, but n no, but neither is it anywhere near my least favourite. It's one of the very few Dungeons and Dragons modules that I've played as a player. Um, there, there's uh, you can count them on one hand, really. I've been kind of coerced into being a dungeon master for most of. Let's say that like like oh no, I've got to be dungeon master again. Actually, I quite enjoy it. But the, uh, so it's one of the few modules that I've I've actually played. And I've obviously refereed it as well. Um, it's always been a lot of fun, especially if you've got people that are into dinosaurs. Uh, if you've got, um, I find that kids they kind of love dinosaurs when they're when they're younger, and then as they get older, they they unless they turn into a paleontologist, they they kind of lose that love for before dinosaurs. So if, if you catch if you catch kids at the right time with it, uh, it it's brilliant. The, the Oh, especially if you keep it secret that there's dinosaurs in the island. So when they finally break out into the jungles and and like Jurassic Park moment, you know, when uh, when 
they they turn around and and there's the brachiosaur and they go oh my god it's a dinosaur given that kind of experience in that kind of moment with the with the Isle of Dread or dinosaurs in general um then then it's brilliant for that uh, especially especially if they've gone through sort of traditional fighting orcs and goblins and everything else up until that point and then sort of you know oh wow there's dinosaurs in Dungeon Dragons too um can kind of build some cool moments and and the Isle of Dread, like the Tomb of Horrors and like a, a, like a Keep on the Borderlands, it's sort of one of those adventures that ends up being a shared experience for for um, D and D players of a, of certain ages, uh, because we we went through all of these adventures. We all had experiences with them in one shape or form. Um, so it is one of those things where if you get a D and D player that is of an an age that uh, that has has played it, then that shared oh this is what happened to us when we went to the 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 uh, the, um, the uh the isle of dread and all oh, well where we did this and the other one and oh didn't you find this and so, well, no where was that and so on so it's it's one of those sh this those common locations that people have gone to um it's kind of like you know your holiday snaps when you go uh, you know we've been to this particular beach and so on oh what did you find we've been there as well what did you think of the hotel and so uh, except in D, D terms so there are quite there are certain modules that are touchstones for everyone there are some obscure ones that not everyone has played through but there are some especially the ones that were in the rule box set um b2 b1 x1 that that are common touchstones where the shared experience of of D and and um and specific adventures uh, that can really grab that community that the community spirit so yeah uh x1 brilliant adventure um sort of ranks midfield or the upper end of midfield in in the li long list of adventures uh, and goodman's treatment of it in the fifth edition conversion and its celebration stuff uh is is good as ever <clears throat> uh one of the better ones that they did they've done the interviews are pertinent uh, the interviews and the monologues are pertinent and on point um they've got at least one of the original designers talking about it unfortunately the uh tom moldve um not available for shall we say uh for providing any material for it but uh and Lawrence Schick's insights into into the way that Mystara was at least originally constructed um they're, they're, they're interesting stuff so the the uh the preamble is on point and good the scans by the by it's, it's nice to have them in a in a collected form like that and especially for reference back when you're you've got the um the, the conversion and the original side by side like that and the conversion uh the basic conversion as good as ever the additional material in it um really does to bring the island to life it, it's uh it's something that I, I know when i've run i've never considered in adding more to the island uh and but now i've read that it's sort of you know why why didn't i ever think of doing something like this uh, and especially the way that they've linked some of the uh, some of the encounters together and you know developed the encounters from the original module uh, and provided more information to go through so really good um i recommend it as i've recommended all the goodman volumes that i've reviewed so far um you you can't go wrong with them if you're of the mindset that uh, that you want a bit of uh, of old school in your life using new school rules. Uh, so that's it for this one. Um, I thought I would throw that out because for some reason I grabbed it off my shelf the other day and uh, and re reading it through. Not for the idea of, of giving it a, a video review like this, but just because I fancied reading it again. Um, and, well, that led to going, well, I've done done some of the others i might as well do this one as well while i'm while i've got it off the shelf so there you go uh, until the next video then have fun enjoy um, whatever you may be doing uh, it's a, an easter break at the moment um and uh and i'm sort of just coming out of uh, of some drug addled recovery process so uh hopefully 
I'll, um, well, <laughs> not be in so much pain. That's the, uh, that's the goal here. Right, so take care until the next video.